Good day, and welcome to the Conference Board webcast, Disability in the Workplace in China, How to Move the Needle. Uh, today, we're going to look at some critical questions and issues uh, that have to do with disabilities in the workplace in China and some of the action items that employees can do uh, to mitigate and improve the circumstances. So we're going to look at a deep understanding of the living and working conditions for people with disabilities in China. Uh, we'll have information on the Chinese government approach to improving employment for the disabled population and the implications of these approaches and applications for businesses. Uh, we'll look into the effective approach companies are using now to employ people with disabilities in China, motivation, successes, challenges, and impacts. And finally, we'll offer some practical guidance on international approaches and best practices for employing people with disabilities and to what extent these can be leveraged in China. So before we get started, uh, I'm going to give you some tips on how to participate in the webcast. First of all, to ask questions as they occur, there's a chat box at the bottom left of your screen. And as these questions come in, we'll try and weave them into the conversation with our presenters. Feel free to download the presentation via the download file pod in the bottom center of your screen. And you may go full screen the video or, or the PowerPoint at any time by clicking the four arrows at the top right of the screen. Uh, at the end of this webcast, we're going to ask you a big favor and to complete an evaluation. So uh, that information is really important for us so we can help improve our services to you in the future. And of course, you can share this program with colleagues. It will be available on demand uh, on this webcast uh, on the conference board website uh, within 24 to 48 hours after the completion of our webcast. So for those of you earning, looking to earn credits, uh, you need, first of all, probably most important, you need to stay on the line for the full hour. Uh, the notion that there will be pop-up boxes that come in, you need to click the box. The credits that are available are the HRCI, the SHRM credits, and the CPE credits. So remember, stay on for the full webcast, hit the box when you're asked to, uh, asked to confirm that you're still there. So I'm really excited to have, uh, to introduce our presenters for today. In studio today, they have uh, Suzanne Briere. Suzanne is currently a professor of disability studies and director of the K. Lisa Yang and Hockey Tang Institute on Employment and Disability at Cornell's ILR School. Uh, the Yang uh, Tang Institute is a, a research training and technical assistance center focusing on disability inclusion and employment, uh, education and community. And she is the co-author, author and co-author of four books and over 120 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on workplace disability inclusion. Suzanne, welcome to the webcast. Thank you, Chuck. I'm delighted to be here. And also joining us is Habin Zhou is, uh, in, from Washington, D.C. He's the founder and executive director of Easy Inclusion. He's ILO Global Business and Disability Network, China consultant, chief supervisor of Inclusion China, and a State Department fellow to the American Association of People with Disabilities. Uh, and in recent years, he's worked on the uh, ILO office in China and Mongolia as a national program coordinator. Habin, welcome to us. Welcome to the webcast. Hello, good morning, Chuck. Hello. Everyone. And last but not least, we have Anka Schrader, who's in Beijing. Uh, who's, Anka leads our research here at the Conference Board uh, China Center, and she has lived and worked in China for more than 15 years and is the author of numerous publications on China's development agenda and civil, civil society, society environment. And her work has been cited in media outlets like China Fortune, uh, Bloomberg, mm -hmm. CNN, China Daily. And Anka also serves as chair of the Business Sustainability Committee at the American Chamber of Commerce in China. Anka from Beijing, welcome. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, good evening. All right, so let's get to the substance. Anka, um, the first question I'd like to ask you is that when you listen to some of the, uh, some of these challenges in China, or excuse me, I, I know that the China Center and the Yang Tang Institute for Employment and Disability at Cornell have partnered to study uh, disability in the workplace in China. So based on this work, can you give us a quick overview of the current situation in China? Yes, certainly. Um, so simply because of the size of China, obviously we have um, a very, very large um, number of people with disabilities. If we look at just um, officially available data um, that comes from, from national level surveys, uh, we have at least um, um, 85 million people with a disability living in China. Um, but because of the very narrow definition of disability in China, which is very much rooted in the medical model, we actually believe that um, this is a 
<clears throat> that this is a, a gross underestimation of the actual population of people with disabilities. So if we take um, international average pre um, prevalence rates for adults, um, which are more around 15 percent, then um, we would probably see up to two times as many people with a disability in China than what the official numbers are quoting. So we'd be talking in the range of 170 million people, which is, you know, half of the size of the population of, of the U.S. Um, so in terms of um, the institutional environment in China, um, China looks very good on paper. It has um, actually quite a substantive amount of uh, regulations around protecting the legal rights of people with disabilities. It's engaged in the inter international um, sphere. But actually, in reality, when it, come down, when it comes down to key legislation and its implementation, um, it really boils down to a national um, quota scheme that is trying to regulate employment in the private sector. Um, this quota scheme was implemented in the 80s. Um, it's nationwide. It applies to most private and public sector businesses. Um, and companies are required to hire a minimum of 1.5% um, of their workforce um, from, um, from the population of persons with disabilities. Um, the quotas, and um, if, if you don't meet the quota, you um, are required to pay a fine into the disability fund. Um, that money is, is supposed to be used uh, to help with training and education of people with disabilities. Um, and then also for companies who are um, meeting or exceeding the quotas, there's a number of um, financial incentives. Um, they're offered through government subsidies and uh, social insurance schemes, wage support, training support. Um, so there's a range of, of uh, financial incentives offered to meet the quota. Um, but be, uh, even though this quota is in place and has been in place for, for many, many years, the employment outcomes for, um, for people with disabilities in China are still relatively bleak. So we're looking at a picture where we see low employment participation overall and, and relatively high unemployment rate amongst the uh, population of people with disabilities. Um, employment is also largely not market driven. Um, it's really limited to opportunities um, um, inside of the rural areas and outside of urban centers, um, and then we're also not seeing an ins we're not seeing a we're not seeing a sufficient um, return on employment. So there's a very large wage differential, for example, in urban areas between households with and without um, persons with disabilities. Um, there are a number of reasons that are um, that are the cause of of these employment outcomes. Um, Obviously, at the top is, is an institutional framework that isn't really working efficiently. So the quota system itself is not effective in enabling um, market participation for people with, dis with disabilities. And um, in 2015, this is the latest data that we have, we had something like 0.3% of the urban um, um, employment um, being people with disabilities. So this is obviously a very... Um, distance away from the 1.5 percent that the quota is stipulating. Um, so it gives you an idea of, of the struggles to, to, to meet those quotas. Um, there's very poor access to education. Um, there's really very few people um, with disabilities who are properly equipped with the skills to compete in China's modern labor market. Um, there's demographic immobility issues. I mentioned that before. Most uh, people with disability are uh, residing in rural areas, so don't have access to um, the urban labor market where most of employment growth is happening. There's a lot of social stigma around disability still. Um, it's very deeply ingrained in society, um, and that hinders um, employment participation. Um, so prejudices remain high within the workplace. There's a strong focus um, towards sheltered employment and specialized career path and not towards integration into um, the general workforce. No, Good thanks, Anka. That's a really good setup. And Suzanne, when you listen to some of these challenges, uh, what's going on in China and the disability workplace, to, to what extent to, does that kind of tally with the situation in the U.S., past and present? Are there lessons to be learned uh, and issues to be addressed? Absolutely. It's great to have an opportunity to talk about that and compare, and it's why we really enjoyed <clears throat> excuse me, this collaborative <clears throat> relationship with the Conference Board China Center. 
In the United States, we see some similar continuing gaps in employment, although we certainly have many resources and we've had regulatory structures in place to minimize discrimination and maximize participation in employment for people with disabilities. As you can see here, we continue, this is recent data, uh, recently analyzed 2017 data from the U.S.'s um, American Community Survey and from the statistics there we can see that there is a continuing large gap for people with disabilities in the United States. They're uh, less than a half proportionately employed than their non-disabled peers, a gap of 42 percent from their 37 percent participation rates for people with disabilities compared to almost 80 percent for people without. So significant gap there and and that gap has been um, has been there for a while. As you can see from this next slide, uh, we look just over 10 years. We can look back much further. But in the last 10 years, there's been slight fluctuations between uh, about 40 percent and 77 percent in 2008 to the current statistics I just gave you. So unfortunately, that gap hasn't changed very much. It has continued to be quite significant. And there's great concern about this. Not only do we want people in the workforce because they have a right to be there and we need their talents, but it significantly impacts um, their socioeconomic status. As we can see by this slide, there's a 20, um, a 26, uh, 50, uh, I'm sorry, a 16 percent gap between the poverty rates of people with disabilities, which is at 26 percent, and the 10 percent poverty average a poverty rate on the average for non-disabled people in the United States. So quite a significant impact when people are not working. And that results in similarly a significant household income rate where the average household income rate in the United States is 71%, $71,000, it's $45,500 for individuals with disabilities in the house when they're in the household. That's a gap of $25,000. $500 um, for people annually, so a significant impact when you're not able to be fully participating in the workforce in America. And that uh, yeah, very significant impact. Uh, and, and when we look at the, at the China notion, how does this transfer over into, into uh, the situation now as Anka was addressing it? Uh, well, we certainly have begun to put uh, supports in place. We have had services since the uh, since First World War for veterans with disabilities that over the years have blossomed into services for that are available through the state federal system for all, all Americans with disabilities in the U.S. So we have a robust support system to provide training and technical assistance um, and, and many thousands of community service providers. We are trying to move people out of what were community settings that we now C is segregated that came up in the 1960s. Uh, we were happy at the time to be building facilities to get people out of their homes and get them into employment, but it was segregated employment. And now we're working very hard to get people into more integrated settings actually in the workplaces across America. And we're moving on that, but it's, it's been slower than many people would like. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anka, a question for you. As part of the, the, your partnership uh, with Cornell, um, you recently hosted a, a practitioner workshop in China uh, where companies brainstormed ideas on how to successfully and effectively uh, reach that uh, talent pool of people with disabilities. Um, can you share some of those key conclusions from that workshop with us and, uh, and with our audience? Yes, so some of the key challenges that were identified by the people in the room really centered around um, or are derived from the challenges that I, I um, described earlier. So chief among them really is the issue of a lack of education and training. Um, so this is the first real challenge is to even identify the right talent that is certified um, and is, is able and willing to work. And so these are, this is the first very big hurdle for, for companies, even if they're willing um, to look for disabled talent, um, it, it is proving very hard. And the fact that um, because of the, squ uh, the quota scheme, only certified um, um, persons can be counted towards the, the quota, that makes it even harder because many, many people are not certified. 
and they cannot be counted towards the quota. Um, another issue is that um, many companies still see the fine really more as a fee. So when we were talking around the room, um, the share of people who are actually meeting that quota, so that 1.5%, is very, very, very low. The vast majority of companies are not able to meet that 1.5%, and they're paying the fine, and they're paying it very easily. So again, it's more almost like it's, it's considered a fee, right? Um, so there isn't any kind of um, strong incentive to overcome it. Now, recently, we've seen some change in 2016. Um, new regulations were enacted that changed the way the fines for not achieving a quota were calculated. Um, they used to be on a, um, so part of that calculation was um, the average wage level within the region, for example, within the city. Now it's changed to the average wage within the company. So obviously for companies that have high um, average wage levels, that makes a big difference in the calculation. So there has been some incentive to move away from paying the fine towards um, the quota, but it's slow. Um, then we have a whole different set of problems around recruitment agencies. So there's been a trend where um, agencies offer fake employment um, for people who basically then have uh, supposedly a contract, but they don't actually go and work. So they work for very, very low wages, so something that's lower than the fine would be, and are employed, and you count these people towards the quota. So this is something that's a, a problem, kind of an illegal problem that's been going on. Um, People are struggling with that. And then um, um, another key challenge is really that I think because of these challenges um, that, 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 that I describe, um, many individuals really feel discouraged um, to, to, to work. Um, so this is, has been a, a real issue also in recruiting, um, that people are um, um, not very forward in applying for jobs, or they feel easily discouraged when it seems too um, too difficult, when it seems too challenging, um, when accommodation isn't yet in place, for example. So all of these are, are, are major issues. Um, in terms of the successful strategies that were discussed in the room, um, there are obviously many, um, but these are kind of the top ones that, that, that I picked up on. So with, with anything that you try to implement, I think that is something that no matter what we're talking about is important, is really the top-level buy-in. So you know, developing leadership commitment and articulating disability inclusion as a business strategy is really important. Um, and then gaining support from business units. So very often, business units are resisting um, to add people with disability to their team because they feel it's going to be a drag uh, on their budget and on productivity. So helping with that transition, to, um, you know, helping business leaders make the numbers work, for example, through offering internship programs that kind of eases that transition or creating a special fund to relieve business units leaders' budgets, at least initially, um, until dis disabled candidates can establish themselves, all of that can help. Um, then managing the managers. So it's really important that managers understand their roles and accountabilities um, around workplace um, disability inclusion and enforcing um, values. Um, then um, recruiting channels. So there's a lot of, there can be a lot of creativity that can be applied around recruiting channels. Um, for example, um, asking colleagues for referrals uh, of families and friends with disabilities. Um, there's a number of um, specialized recruiters that can help to identify talent. Um, there's been a number of, of agencies that have been successful in this space in China. Partnering with universities, especially with special education colleges, so that you create a talent pipeline. Um, tap into the International Labor Organization's database of people with disability. Um, like I said earlier, setting up internship programs. So the state now offers a significant subsidy program if you hire interns with, with a disability. So these are significant sums of money that really helps to kind of you know, ease that financial burden and getting people foot in the door, proving themselves, you know, making it worthwhile. Um, and then last but not least, like measuring for success, obviously measuring what you're doing, tracking progress, um, and setting reasonable, really setting reasonable goals. So really identifying positions where people with disabilities can really reasonably succeed so that you have a sustainable program, something that you can slowly build on. Uh, good, thanks, Anka. Yeah, those, those, are, those, uh, those sound like uh, really good strategies and a lot of uh, maybe a heavy lift in some cases. We do have one question, and I think it kind of ties in with one of your, your earlier points. And this is also, Haben, feel free to, to jump in and answer as well. 
but we're talking about labor labor force participation, I guess self-identification. And in the grand, in the in the, in the larger context, have you seen uh, an increase in the size or a decrease in the size of the of the disabled labor force in China? Uh, and I guess this revolves around the issues of of self-identification. And a second question I wanted to tack on on this is. You know, we're talking about quotas and regulation in the regulatory environment, but is that regulatory environment different for local Chinese companies as opposed to uh, multinationals? So Anka or Haben or Suzanne, please feel free to jump in. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can, I can probably answer these two questions. Um, so, in in terms of the uh, the number of of people, if we look at a longer term uh, um, time frame, the numbers haven't changed all that much, but the composition has obviously changed. So China is amidst a really significant demographic transition. Um, and so some of the, uh, you know, early, um, some of the um, technology has really enabled to prevent um, certain types of disabilities. So certain types of disabilities have uh, gone down in percentage wise, but obviously um, age related disabilities have gone up significantly as a share. And so we're seeing kind of a change in the composition of what types of disabilities we're seeing um, in the general population. But um, the numbers overall have not changed all that dramatically. Um, they've gone down a little bit, but not by much. And um, in terms of um, in terms of the regulations for local companies and MNCs, uh, there's, there's no difference. So these regulations of so the quota system applies um, to any company that has more than 20 employees and has been in business for more than three years. And it doesn't matter if um, it's, it's an MNC or a local company. In fact, it applies to the public sector. So government agencies are supposed to enforce the quotas. It's another big issue because even the government agencies aren't successful at all in doing mm. that. That's, and just, I, I guess, the, the, the question, the law is on the books and it applies across the board, but it, only on enforcement side, do you see mm -hmm. uh, a, a, any kind of a difference or targeting? I mean, we know about the trade tensions that are going on between the U.S. and China. Uh, is, is, are the, is, is that sort of focus on MNCs or U.S.-based MNCs having kind of any impact on, on enforcement on this? I, I wouldn't think. I haven't seen anything to that effect, not okay. directly. Uh, yeah, neither from my side. I, I see a lot of Chinese companies also have the similar concern and also try very hard at the same time with multinationals. So it's all the okay. same. Good, and a good segue. And Haben, I know that uh, your work with Easy Inclusion and the ILO, that you've engaged extensively with companies uh, in China on the issues of, of disability. Uh, can you share some, some examples of, of, uh, of success, some of the companies that, in, in your uh, opinion, uh, have an effective approach uh, of employing people with disabilities? Uh, and does anyone stand out uh, as actually having managed to I guess change the focus from compliance to uh, to a competitive advantage. Oh yes, uh, thank you for this question, Chuck. Uh, actually, when I work with a lot of multinationals, and I find that they're really doing something excellent. So I will give you uh, three examples. Two are from America, and one is from Germany. And the first case is from Disneyland uh, in Shanghai Pudong area. So since uh, 2016, they start to recruit people with disabilities. And th this project called Magic or Disability Hiring Program, that's kind of a uh, very interesting program. Only two years and a half, I would say they have more than 200 people with disability on board. So it's very amazing, successful. And when you look at why they do this, and it's very interesting that they're uh, facility is very accessible according to American disability standard and this apply to China as well so after they build this accessible environment they find that a lot of customer with disability is going to Disneyland and they don't have man many people with disability working for them so they start to use this facility but also recruiting staff <coughs> with disability and what they do is they work with China Disabled Person Federation and other disabled persons organizations that try to uh, find the talent pool. And what they do is they also introduce kind of Shanghai Disabled Person Federation to hold a uh, job fair. What they do is they, uh, every Friday, any people with disability, you find 
uh, you are uh, suitable for the job announced, you can visit there on Friday. So it's very unique compared to other multinationals. It's uh, open to uh, this kind of opportunity. And uh, the third part I want to mention is that they do a lot of training to their uh, senior managers and to line managers and also the kind of customer service phase make them to understand how to work with your coworker with disability. And also when customer with disability go to the Disneyland, how you do with that. And they have career open day, invite people with intellectual disability, people with autism, and people using wheelchair to, to try to have a feeling of how is that working in Disneyland. This is the first case. I think that's kind of, uh, when I, when I, talk with them uh, and I find that they are really kind of jumping out uh, from my uh, understanding. The second uh, case is, is uh, Starbucks. So Starbucks starts uh, in Guangzhou uh, a sign language thematic shop just uh, three days ago. And this shop have uh, 16 or 14 uh, staff with hearing impairment. And what they do is they try to uh, provide uh, accessible equipment and also you can order it in a screen that you don't need even to talk with the staff so you can do it easily and they change the facility so that the workers with the hearing impairment can use all the equipment and what they also do you can see the picture they are training uh, the, the non-disabled workers to, to use sign language and talk with the, the people with hearing impairment and uh, I visit the, uh, the 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 Starbucks uh, the the shop one month ago and the feeling is very welcoming and you can see people with hearing impairment they talk to you using sign language teaching you how to say hello ni hao it's very very kind of wonderful experience if I am a customer with disability I definitely would like to visit and so far as I know in Guangzhou they have done this uh, people with intellectual disability autism working in the coffee shop for more than five years. And at least they have 20 staff with people with intellectual disability and autism working in Guangzhou and the, the southern area. So the collaboration with the local NGO is very important. They work with Guangdong Disabled Person Federation and uh, the Association for, of People with Hearing Impairment in, Guang, in Guangdong so that they have talent pro through the local government and the, uh, the local associations. So you can see this is a very wonderful example. I think in the future, Starbucks will, will, will very easily to attract customers with disability to go there, which if you consider in China, you have such a big population. And many of the family members, they, are, they have people with disability. So it, it's a very good for your brand. So that's the, uh, the, what I learned in Starbucks. Next, next one. It's a German company. I think many of you are using their cars. It's Volkswagen. So Volkswagen in Tianjin, they start this project three years ago. They call it Work to Work. And it's very interesting. They learned this from Germany. But in Germany, that Work to Work project focuses on people with elderly age, uh, older workers that return to the labor market. And in China, they find that what kind of techniques they deliver developed in Germany is easily applied in China, like job accommodation, like how to change the facility more accessible to a person with disability. So they start this journey and in 2016. At this moment, they have 24 staff with disability working in Tianjin uh, office. And what they, they do an excellent job, they work with uh, uh, Tianjin uh, Technology University and they have uh, people with uh, uh, a school for people with hearing impairment. So they start an internship so that uh, the students can, can have the job experience inside the factory and inside the office. And the, the co-workers understand, okay, the internships, intern st students have a very strong capacity working with us. So that make confident of co-workers working with them. Then it come into the real job. Uh, 24 staff working in their uh, in their office at this moment. So that's is the three examples I share track. 
I think uh, we can continue the discussion how can other company can learn from the, these three companies. No, absolutely. I think those are really great examples. Uh, and I, I guess one thing that jumps out at me uh, is that at least I can speak to Disney uh, and, and Starbucks, that they're two companies with very strong corporate cultures. Uh, and that obviously, and you know, from the headquarters uh, in the U.S., say uh, that really translates. That corporate culture really does translate across all their uh, uh, all their establishments uh, and geographies that they work in. I, I had right. the the good fortune to to be with our diversity and inclusion council at Disney World a few months back, with the focus on oh. uh, employees with disabilities and also customers with disabilities. And what they do in the park to make those accommodations to make people comfortable. It's about having a good time, right? And the, you know, Disney really does some very innovative things on the customer side uh, to accommodate and make people with disabilities give them that experience that uh, that everyone at Disney has. Uh, and I just thought I was very impressed with their notion. And now hearing that they're doing the same thing in China. Uh, again, I think speaks to a really strong corporate culture there. And uh, those are interesting, really interesting examples. Um, and I think it's a, also a good segue uh, for Suzanne, uh, you know, based on your research um, and, and what you've learned to date, um, can you share some approaches, uh, some of the important international approaches and best practices uh, for hiring people with disabilities? Absolutely. You know, Anka made uh, reference to a number that we have learned from our conversations with colleagues and, uh, and prior research um, about what's happening in China. And they're very consistent with what we see as good practices in the United States. We've been doing research looking at across companies in a, in a wide variety of ways, trying to learn more about what seems to work. Um, we've done focus groups, we've done deep dives into companies, and we've done surveys across a no number of companies. I'm going to share with you the results of uh, surveys of HR professionals that we did in collaboration uh, with the Society for Human Resource Management. And what we did was look at good, a list, a pre-existing list of good practices, and um, and what would uh, what we felt would be a good list to start with, and asked our informants about 700 of them what they felt uh, was currently something that they were doing in their own work environment. And we asked it across the employment process. The first slide that I have to share with you focuses on the response of these folks, um, these company representatives on affirmative hiring initiatives and the list we asked them to respond to. We also asked them if they'd been doing hiring in the last year and had hired people with disabilities. So we then correlated those results and we found out that when the more of these good practices that the company did, the higher the likelihood that indeed they would have successfully hired a person with a disability in the last year. But we also found that some of these practices seem to heighten the likelihood that they would have had a successful hire. And that's what this slide shows, is, is targeted internships, and Anka mentioned that this is happening in China, it's a terrific um, way to get started. It, uh, six times more likely when companies reported that they were doing these targeted internships for people with disabilities that they would have successfully hired a person with a disability in the last year. And it has an advantage not only because it gives young people work experience, as Hyben was suggesting that some of the companies he was showcasing do, it really helps um, the young person get something on their resume, get exposure to the work environment, but it also helps to educate supervisors and the general workforce about what it means to integrate people successfully and, and help them to mitigate any fears they might have about being able to be good supervisors if a person needs accommodations or some kind of extra support as they get integrated into the workforce. The next uh, highest, and Anka mentioned this as well, if there was strong senior management commitment that the company reported they did have, five times more likely to successfully have hired. Four times as likely to have successfully hired if they had explicit organizational hiring goals. So there is a benefit to having targets that companies have that we sometimes impose on them. This can be one, is that having explicit goals that the company embraces 
The distinction I would make is rather than just compliance, we are really looking for here goals that the company sets for themselves to really be successfully affirmative in hiring, but it makes a difference. Three times more likely that they would have hired in the last year if they have active recruiting, screening, interviewing, um, and if they have a disability in their diversity and inclusion plan, and relationships with community organizations that help them to source qualified candidates. We also ask, because it's really important that we don't just get people into the workforce, that um, what they were doing in terms of helping to retain people. And we did find that these were practices that our informants said were the most effective, having a targeted employee business or resource group within their, their company, having follow-along case management services for return to work, as Anka mentioned, we have larger proportions of older uh, employees now in our workforces. Many people are wanting to work longer. So providing case management support to these individuals facilitates retention. Companies know that. And those kinds of good practices also can help in supporting other uh, new people who are coming to the workforce who have disabilities of some kinds. Being flexible in work arrangements, again, another thing that our, our informant said was a positive thing and having targeted mentoring programs helps people in retention. We also asked about accommodations, and I'll just mention these as good examples as well of what facilitates hiring, retention, centralized fund for accommodations, so individual units within companies aren't concerned about having to pay for accommodations, having a point person for accommodation questions, formalizing that accommodation process in some way, um, having both internal resources that you can use, like your health and safety or ergonomic, ergonomics team, but also knowing where the community resources are when you need them. And having targeted training for supervisors, as well as goals for supervisors that are consistent with your affirmative hiring and retention goals for the company. And embedding this, these kinds of good practices throughout the HR process. So. Um, that's, that's it on that one. All right. Uh, Susanna, yeah, one question that did come in, it was just a question about the survey and the setup. Was there a segmentation, uh, a break on uh, industry or company size uh, for the data? On both, Chuck. Yes. As we picked our sample, we, we stratified it across those two. So it is representative uh, for not only large companies, which often we hear about their best practices, but also mid and smaller companies as well. As we do know, smaller companies don't have as many resources, and that's where we usually coax, coach them, coax them to think about using the community resources, many of which are, are free to them to access. Okay, good, uh, good answer. Um, and just in the, you know, in the context of what we've just heard uh, Suzanne talk about yeah. uh, effective practices, uh, do, do you have... Um, in that Chinese context, do you know of any companies that are already doing this outside of those case uh, case studies or case examples that, that, that you've already shared with us? Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, I think uh, Susanna's uh, research uh, reflect what I see uh, in the Chinese companies and also multinational in China. One example is uh, a company called Flex, which is registered in Singapore, but I have a big uh, 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 operation in southern China. You can find that they start with uh, internship opportunity uh, for uh, students with disabilities. And also, they have a committee that composed of their senior management, including the CEO and also the uh, uh, CSR and the team, and also business unit. So they have regular meetings. And also, they develop kind of a pr procedure menu. So what you do when you have uh, staff with disability on board, they are very clear uh, kind of uh, uh, what to what do list. So that's very helpful. And they build very strong external and internal uh, kind of focal person. And to, uh, for example, they work with uh, NGOs that they can provide sign language training and provide assistance to their staff with disability. So I think this is one excellent example renowned uh, Rather than what Susanna has just said. And uh, from the NGO side, uh, do you have in mind, or Anka or Haben or Suzanne, uh, any NGOs that have uh, had effective partnerships with uh, with corporations to uh, 
to enact change and engage uh, people with disabilities in the workplace. Are there are there are, are there some innovative NGOs out there that uh, that are having impact and and moving the needle? Good yeah. Yeah, I can I can name two. I can name two. Uh, one is called uh, uh, Guangzhou uh, English Training Center for people with disability. That uh, training center started more than 30 years ago. So every year they train a group of people with disability, young English classes. And in the recent 10 years, they start to develop an internship opportunity open to all the companies. So company can interact with Guangzhou, uh, they call it Sanpei, uh, Getch. So they can contact Getch and provide uh, internship opportunity. So they now very working very well. So another one in Beijing, it's called the uh, Rongai Ronglu Family Association. What they do, they have a team around 14 job coach so that the company can reach them. And what they do is introduce people with intellectual and uh, autism to uh, along with the job coach so that the job coach can develop the jobs positions with the company. I think that's uh, the, the two NGOs I know quite working very well in that. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That's I think that that's an interesting point. I think when you bring up the notion of autism, I I think one of the the the, the issues that, that that maybe starts to arise is I know in other geographies in the U.S. and Europe, there's a real focus or beginning to be a real focus on mental health issues. Uh, and the notion of autism, uh, you know, people with autism uh, as 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 having an impact on the on the talent pool. Um, and, in China, is this what's the separation? What's the what's the notion between the notion of mental health issues and physical disabilities? I mean, they seem now to be uh, in, in other geographies. Uh, it, it's it's all uh, it's all accepted as as one one talent one big talent pool. But as there as differences in in China. I, yes, uh, there. Say, I mean, I can. Go ahead, can can start oh, first. Go ahead, okay, okay. So <laughs> pe people with autism in China is uh, character as uh, people with mental disability. So uh, th that's an official kind of uh, certificate. But in general, I would say the labor force is still have a very strong fear or uh, afraid of people with mental uh, challenge, and uh, very few people with autistic. Uh, uh, challenge can uh, can enter the labor market. Although SAP is doing something in China, but I would say still it's kind of people with uh, mobility issues, hearing impairment or visual impairment is more kind of have more chances to the labor market in China. That, that's my feeling. Anka, what, what do you think? Yes, I, I would agree with that. So I think there's still um very much a segregation here between um, physical disabilities um, and, and, and mental disabilities. And I think the general um, consensus amongst most people is still that it's um, people with mental disabilities cannot really contribute productively to the workforce. And it's more around um, providing social security, right? Making sure um, People have sustenance, they have housing, um, they're taken care of. So the thought process of most people centers around that, not creating um, an environment that would enable um, people with mental disabilities to participate in the workforce. Unfortunately, I think that that thinking is still quite prevalent in China. Yeah, Chuck, I, I'll jump in here too because uh, I think I, I appreciate you bringing it up because mental health related issues in the United States is still problematic for employers. I think it's one of the areas where we have struggled, continued to struggle. And there is a sort of a bifurcation in some ways. I think our many employers have become much more proactive looking at their health benefits and realizing that mental health related services are on the uptake. Many of us are anxious in the workplace. There's a lot of stress. And I think companies are doing a much more proactive uh, uh, set of initiatives to try to take care of those things. But people who have a history and it's evident of a mental health related disorder still find it very difficult, I think, to get into the workplace. So there is stigma there. Although autism was mentioned and there are 
numerous autism affirmative hiring programs going on in the U.S. Heidi mentioned uh, SAP, and that's true certainly here, out of their Philadelphia office. And they're now, I believe, in something like 16 countries, they have these initiatives. So things are changing, um, and it's great to see companies taking the initiative to do that. Microsoft, Ernst & Young, J.P. Morgan Chase um, also have these programs. So we're incrementally making some changes, which yeah. is great to see. Yeah, I think when overall, in the, in, in the context, in, in, in almost, I think globally, you get a sense that there is momentum building and probably or, or certainly contributing to, to the momentum to some extent is the tightness of the global labor markets, right? So the, 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 the importance of extending uh, and broadening the talent pools. But yeah, you certainly, from, from, from our members that we hear and from your information and research, it seems that there's some, there's some really positive and meaningful positive momentum, uh, not only uh, in, in mature economies, but also in emerging markets like China. So I think that's, that, that, that's certainly good news. So, I, and this is a, the, this notion of the sense of effectiveness of the regulatory framework to guide employees' policies, uh, particularly in China. Uh, challenges and upsides, local government participation, the challenges there, I imagine that it's, uh, you know, it, all economics are local uh, and probably all policy guidance is local to some extent, right? Uh, you have the, the centralized notion, but then the enforcement is really on the ground. So. Ankar, how and do you? What are the challenges and, and, and the upsides of of, uh, of of the regulatory framework and how it's guiding employers' practices in China? Well, Chuck, I think obviously in, in in first instance the quota scheme is supposed to incentivize the private sector to get engaged, and that in itself in itself is is, is a good thing. Um, it's um, it's more an issue around enforcement and specificity of the laws. Um, so this is this is one area, for example, that is, that is really challenging. Um, for example, there is a, a law around accommodations, but it's rarely enforced. Um, so very often, um, do you see companies, even very, quite progressive com companies, struggling with this because they do not um, invest into this at all. Um, now another area I think where um, the regula regulatory framework or the overall framework really is uh, is failing is education. I think we talked a little bit about this. Um, just simply um, the discrepancies between um, um, average um, population educational outcomes and persons with disability education outcomes, they are very significant. Um, and so obviously this is at the root cause of everything. Um, you know, this is where where the buck stops. If if the education system can't be transformed um, to get more people the right skill sets to succeed in the labor market, a quota system will ultimately not work. Um, and then another issue that I think um, is is tricky in China um, with the regulatory framework uh, is around um, anti-discrimination measures. Um, so there's really a, a, um, there's there's no um, in many of the regulations that we have around um, um, you know including people with disability in the, in the workforce or you know social security uh, for people with disability a lot of um, anti discrimination clauses are worked into those regulations but they really aren't very specific and um, there's no legal recourse really or very specific legal recourse for for victims of discrimination and that makes it very very hard. Um, to enforce any any of, of, of the regulations. And so this is also, again, this is one of the key points, I think, where the laws have to become more specific and they have to be, you know, they have to be, they have to get better at enforcing them at the on the ground at the local levels. Good. Uh, Javier, sure. Can I, can, can, I, can I add one okay, sentence? More than yeah. one sentence. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I fully agree with what Anka said. So we need a kind of uh, ecosystem to support employers on that. But uh, uh, one element I want to share is that what what a multinational, especially American company, can do in China. Uh, what when I look back on the uh, uh, case of Disneyland, we find that the, they give the employer with disability a kind of uh, equal treatment, or you you are not treated as different persons. So this kind of sense or proudness or is very few 
can, you can see in Chinese companies or, or even the, the, the policies that made the, the underlying assumption is that people with disability, you are getting protection, you get, we offer jobs, thank goodness, take it. So I think that is not uh, very uh, useful for fun companies really have talents that can show their responsibility, take uh, their risk to show uh, they can do some work. So I think what American company in China can do is that to to show that we, we want to have uh, uh, give you equal treatment and uh, welcoming people with disability in there, which is challenging um, the approach, the current approach in Chinese policymaker and also the companies in China. So there will be an opportunity. American companies stand out between other competitors in China. So that's my uh, thinking. No, that, that's a good point. And uh, we have a question in from the audience. It takes us back a little bit to the to the mental health issues, and it and it's and how the question is uh, how are behavior, uh, personality, mood, disabilities classified and supported? You know, by this issues such as uh, anxiety, depression, ADHD. Uh, so that question is uh, how are these uh, behavior, personality, mood, disabilities classified and supported in China? Can anyone take that? Yeah, sure. I, I can throw uh, okay. uh, some ideas, and uh, uh, Anka and uh, Susanna can can help me. Uh, I would say there are many companies, especially multinationals. They have uh, uh, your uh, kind of EAP assistant, a system, so that uh, you can have a hotline uh, to call in and to uh, tell what you have uh, if you have uh, anxiety. Uh, uh, depression, but I would say in the Chinese context, uh, that kind of EAP system is not quite uh, uh, localized. So in Chinese culture, I would say people most like to talk to their friends, their co-workers, or, but not many times to their uh, senior managers. So I would say uh, if the senior managers are aware and have uh, some basic skills, if you can uh, 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 differentiate that people have or don't have this kind of disorder and you, you have some channels or some ways to support uh, your uh, co-worker with disability, that will be fantastic. So that I, I think that's uh, something uh, I, I can see. And another is that I just mentioned the support employment approach is starting in China. So you, are many, you have many provinces, at least Beijing, Guangzhou, Shanghai, and the Hunan province, you can find the job coach that listed in the government uh, system. So you can seek help from job coach and they can support the, uh, your workers that with autism or with some mood disorders that can give some uh, assistance. So that's idea from my side. Fun. Yeah, and I, I will add on to that. I think in the context of the workplace, when it comes to mental health, um, I was, I was going to add that earlier when we had the discussion, but we, when we moved on. Um, I do see that there is a very strongly growing interest in mental health issues at the workplace and that companies are trying to sort out how they can get involved on this issue, how to get employees involved. But it is my general sense that um, this discussion, obviously because we see that happening in the workforce and people are becoming more aware and more outspoken on this, but I think it generally happens outside of the discussion of disability. So I think for most people, um, the, um, these types of mental health issues um, in their minds are not um, a type of disability. So I, that's, that's my observation, um, talking both to employers and, and generally to, to employees. I don't know, Hyman, is that your sense? Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Right. Okay, that's good. I just uh, throw out one uh, one basic question that that did come in from the audience. It was a question about children with disabilities and do they have a right to uh, education in China? Yes, yes, they have uh, a right uh, yeah, to education. Yeah, okay. yeah but uh, the number sorry, showing that yeah, yeah, sorry, Kanka. the number showing that nearly half of the student with disability they are going to segregated education system. Only half of them in the kind of school age, they can go to uh, inclusive education. Uh, but I can see there is a trend that the government give more 
resources to segregated education, which is a pity. But uh, another side, you can see the uh, the there are more kind of uh, a special education counselor uh, is uh, uh, have uh, emerging in some provinces, and the government try to have a special education resource centers. They can visit different uh, uh, schools that support individual disability in the school. So this is uh, uh, the, the legislation in 2016 on the special education uh, uh, regulation is implementing more now. So I think there is a trend. Uh, both the resources are available, but the, there are still strong segregated education at this moment. Mm. Or a ways away from mainstreaming everybody, right? Yeah, and it, it <clears throat> Yeah, and it really goes beyond even education. It goes later than into job placement, where there's also a lot of segregation, and that kind of, you know, um, just exaggerates the problem. Okay, I'm conscious of the time. We have one question that we'd like to, to address about the regulatory frameworks in the U.S. and outside, and, and uh, you know, that, that, that promote uh, uh, affirmation. Uh, are, are, there, are, are there, Suzanne, let me ask you this question. Are there regulatory frameworks in the U.S. and elsewhere that... Uh, that may work in China, that may uh, move the needle even faster and more than uh, what's, what the uh, laws on the books are now? Well, I think, you know, I see certainly some things in the last few years that I find very encouraging. Um, we do have not historically had quotas in the U.S., and we continue not to, Chuck, but we have in the last 10 years or so had targets set. The first was a target set for the federal sector, which is about 2.3 million employees, so that's a big number. And right now, that has fluctuated, but right now it's at 12%, which is quite a high number, and much closer to what we know to be the um, prevalence rates of people with disabilities in the United States. So federal government um, is holding itself to that 12%, which is about what we think the working age population is, which is great. And in the last five years, the Office of Federal Contract compliance programs in the Department of Labor has set out uh, regulations that require federal contractors to have an aspirational goal of 7% of their workforce being people with disabilities. Um, and as that has rolled out, we have seen a lot of activity in the federal contractor space. And this is $10,000 or more, so it covers about a quarter of the American workforce. So that can have quite a significant impact. And we do see uh, employers affirmatively looking at creating partnerships with community organizations, but also there's a requirement to have people, um, to have companies to ask people if they are people with disabilities in confidential, uh, you know, collection of data, so that companies have a sense of who is in their workforce and and how to be able to report. So. That also necessitates culture changes, so people aren't fearful at self-identifying. And so we do see movement having these, these frameworks when they're positively presented as a part of business strategy, not just compliance in the right. workplace. Yeah, the business strategy is the critical part, right? That's going to get the needle moving and... Uh, and uh, uh, and as it's tied to business strategy, it'll be measured and it'll get done, right? And that's going to happen uh, regardless of where that takes place. So, uh, so we're wrapped up. We're getting close to the end here. I'd just like to thank our presenters. I'd like to thank Suzanne from Cornell for for uh, being with me here in the studio. Uh, for Haben in uh, uh, from uh, Easy Inclusion uh, in Washington. Again, thanks for your expertise. It was really appreciated. And my dear friend Anka in Beijing. Uh, Again, thanks for, for all, all your work, and I thought it was a very thoughtful uh, and uh, meaningful webcast, uh, and I think uh, that if our members can, uh, can take some of the actions that they've learned today, that needle will move. So uh, again, thank you for your participation. Uh, one quick note, uh, and I'm always a discount shopper, and we still have time for a discount on our 23rd annual uh, Diversity and Inclusion Conference. This year it's in Brooklyn. Uh, I guess we're being trendy. Uh, but this uh, this conference is uh, it's some of some of the the newest innovative ideas uh, in the diversity and inclusion space and including including uh, I know that there's at least one session in this conference dealing with uh, with with trends and innovations in, for disabilities in the workplace. So uh, if you have time, if you're in the area, if you can attend, I think it's a great event, and I say it's their 23rd annual. 
So I'd like to say thank you for listening. And now just a, another quick reminder uh, that if uh, you can fill out the uh, evaluation form at the end of this conference, it would certain, or at the end of this webcast, it would certainly help us uh, be able to serve you better in the future. And so from the Conference Board Studio in New York, I want to say thanks and have a good day.